Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about a couple things. Um, we're going to talk about the Age of Sigmar, but I'm not going to talk about reviews or anything like that. I'm not going to unbox anything. There's lots of videos out there for that. Many of them have been very good. Instead, I want to go back to where I'm most comfortable, which is talking about game design. And so for people who've watched my channel for a while, you know that uh, I've been doing, I've been an RPG designer for a little more than 10 years. And so I, I, I feel like I understand some of the elements of, of game design, but there's certainly a lot more to learn. I would never claim to be a master. I would claim to be a novice at best. But in looking at the Age of Sigmar, uh, several things became apparent to me. And I've heard a lot of people say this is a totally different game. I've said that. I'm one of the people, I'm one of the many people I've heard say that, for example. And I think that's true, but I don't think that's true in the way that most people mean it. What does that mean, a totally different game? Well, it'd be easy to look at the rules and go, well, that's different. But by that account, you know, 8th edition is much different than 5th edition which I don't think people would mean in the same way. Maybe they mean just the absence of ranks and flanks and stuff like that, but I don't think that's true either. I don't think that's enough to, I don't think that's a large enough gap to say we've got a totally new game. I think there's something else going on here. And I think a lot of people feel it, even if they don't realize it. And I think a lot of the negative reaction to the game has come out of the fact that Age of Sigmar was clearly developed and written and built to allow players to pursue comfortably a much different creative agenda than what the old game was about, than what Warhammer Fantasy Battles 8th Edition was about. And that's what this video is going to be about. We're going to talk about creative agenda and we're going to talk about what it means and all sorts of fun things like that. So here we go. Let's just jump right in. So the first things first, just as a slight aside, I find it absolutely hilarious that every single rumor we had was basically wrong for months. Um, if you go back and look at the specifics, no one ever predicted anything uh, on the meteoric extinction level event that was the Age of Sigmar. There were people who said things are going to be a lot different or these units are going to change or this stuff will be crazy. Um, nothing like this is what I heard, okay, maybe up until a week or two before, and even then was still not really giving the whole picture. So I find it fascinating that it might have been such a big change that people couldn't even really wrap their heads around what they were looking at. So I think that's interesting. But how did it change? Let's get into it. The biggest change comes in a few small, or maybe not so small, uh, changes to design. I honestly don't think a lot of the rules, like the fact that we went from a 200-page book to a four-page pamphlet, really matters that much. Um, I'll talk more about simple games a little later. But there's some very simple things which I'll give examples of that I think really point to what's happened. So the, the to me, the big marked difference is the level of abstractionism has changed. So in Original Warhammer Fantasy and, and, and many war games developed in that time period that Warhammer Fantasy was designed in, there was a very sort of attempt to have a very low level of, of abstractionism. So first things first, all games are abstractions, okay? Let's get that out of the way. All of these war games are abstractions of something. So in this case, we're attempting to simulate... Uh, you know, combat of mass troops slamming into each other. But there are, of course, millions and billions of variables in that. And well, we can't take all that into account. So we have to abstract, right? And so the question is, how far away from reality do we start abstracting? And a lot of older games grew out of, especially war games like this, grew out of war games of the 60s and 50s and 60s, which were very, very, very detailed affairs. They were written by sort of gaming historians and people who were very interested in history because they grew out of history war games. Uh, and so those people were very interested in replicating as close as possible 
the exact effects of the battlefield of comparative stats and lots of corner case situations to try to map what was happening in the game as close to reality in every situation. Okay. Now, role playing, frankly, was the same thing because early role playing rules grew out of early war games players. Uh, the early designers, mostly, of role playing games, especially games like D&D, which set the tone for more or less 20 ish years, um, were very, very avid war gamers playing lots of historical war games. And so having this sort of these this very complex, detailed rule set that had all sorts of different situations in it seemed like that that was the right way to design. And the best rules were those that most closely mapped to reality without just imploding. Now, there are a couple of fantastic rule sets out there that are so insane, that went so far in this direction, uh, that they would boggle your mind. Um, so there's a, a really fun system. I'll, I'll find the link and I'll put it below. You can check it out. Uh, where when you shot at somebody, you determined the bullet, the bullet size, what angle you were at, what where it hit, where it hit the person's body, what organs it could hit, whether the organs were grazed or ruptured, what that meant for injury and time. This is an RPG, but you get the idea. We can get really granular if we want. So 8th edition had this fair amount of, of abstractionism. You still had, of course it was abstracted, duh. You know, the, the reality is like things that were an orc and some giant monster made of stone uh, were the same toughness. Right. So that's an abstractionism. Of course, that's not true. Um, or or is it like who knows? Whatever. It's a game and it's, it's an imaginary world. But it would seem that a flesh and blood thing, even a tough thing like an orc, would not be as tough as a big walking hunk of stone. But here we are. And we all accepted that. And that's fine. We the, you sort of the, the trick with abstractionism is you tend to anchor yourself to it. So I've talked before about the heuristic bias of anchoring but you tend to anchor yourself to a level of abstractionism, and that is the lens through which you will view any particular game. You can go play a different game and not mind a completely different level of abstraction. So the game of life, for example, the board game, is highly abstracted from real life. I don't think anybody looks at the board game life and goes, yeah, that seems like my day to day. Um, it's a super abstracted extrapolation of life, right? But, we accept it because it, that's the lens we've anchored ourselves to for this game. We don't expect super granular stuff. Age of Sigmar abstracted out a lot of things, right? Making, having set to hit numbers, set to wound numbers, these kinds of things. And that can be really jarring for people, okay? And when you, ver when you suddenly change the level of abstraction in a game, and there are other games that have done this too, um, it can be very disorienting to the players because they have a sort of anchor comfort level with how they view the world and the pieces and parts that are in it and how those things then interact with each other, right? And changing the abstraction level changes that. Uh, so I think that is one of the most difficult things. There's nothing right or wrong, by the way, about either one of those. Okay. And if you tell me, well, I just like that more, maybe would be my answer. But I mean, I don't doubt that you're telling me something true. I'm just saying that you probably do a bunch of other things that are more abstracted and a bunch of other things that are less, and you don't mind any of those. Um, so, you know, there, there's a bit of a thing where it's just change is hard and changing the way you perceive a thing is even harder. Um, so that's sort of the first thing. Uh, the second thing I want to address is, and I mentioned at the top, is the creative agenda change. That's really, to me, the big disconnect. The abstraction thing, I think, in the end is small. I think over time, people just adjust to it. But the creative agenda thing is large. So what is a creative agenda? So what I'm referencing here is the big model, which is a, a gaming theory uh, uh, put forward by 
uh, Robin Laws, and um, I'll put a link down below to that. And the big model is a really cool model of the way games function. And there's five individual components. I'm not going to waste time with a lot of them. It's, I could talk for hours on it. It's a fascinating theory. I encourage you to read. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is the creative agenda. The creative agenda is very simple to understand. It's the reason for play. Why are you playing the game you're playing? That's your creative agenda. Okay? So the creative agenda could be, let's imagine we've got a game set in the Old West. Okay. So it's an RPG. You could want to be a sweet gunslinger, and your creative agenda is to really feel the visceral feeling of gunfights at high noon. Right? And so what you favor are rules that really, really, in a detailed, granular fashion, show gunfights and, you know, speed and stuff like that, and this showdown between these two paragons of, of uh, skill with firearms, right, with a six-year. Uh, you might also just want to play the game because you like the idea of living in the Old West and that wild time period and, you know, cowboys and Indians and gold, you know, gold rushes and stuff like that. That could be a thing, okay? The point is there's lots of different reasons to play the game. Um, but they tend to break down into three categories, all right? So, and those are gamism, gamist, narrativist, and simulationist. Now, these terms are often misappropriated to be applied to the game itself. Okay, like the game is simulationist. That's a misappropriation of the term. And I myself am just as guilty of that. I, it's easy to talk that way. That's not right. The players are these doing these things. So what do they mean? All right, we'll be quick because I don't want to bore you to death. There's probably people out there already who've fallen unconscious. But let's try to get through it. Simulationists. Simulationists, okay, want a particular experience out of it. They want to simulate an experience, that they want the world to feel holistically consistent and to replicate that. It is not about realism, though it can be, and is often mistaken for it. It's not true. Imagine that you were trying to be a simulationist with playing in a Golden Age comic book game, like a four-color comic book game, right, the 1960s. That is about as, or sorry, the 1940s. That is about as unreal as it could get, right? Like, that is not a world that looks like any reality. But the game, you would want to be as realistic to that source material as possible, right? So you would, want a, you would want the experience of playing the game to feel like you were playing punch em up two-fist heroes, big, crazy Superman with, you know, unstoppable and, and all this stuff, four-color comic books, all right? That's simulationism. Gamists are, it's often called the step-on-up method. And, and what that means is step up to the plate, basically, right? Gamists pursue an agenda because they want to, I mean, to, to put it short and to mean absolutely to not make this sound like the loaded term as it is, they want to win, all right? It can be a way to, you know, display intelligence or to unlock and explore, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of a game and to know them better than your opponent, to be smarter tactically than your opponent or something like that. They want to prove how their, their skill at the game and win the game. Win. I do not mean that in a negative context. It's a completely valid method of play. Okay? Uh, and finally, narrativists. Narrativists want to tell a story on a theme. So they don't really care about wins and losses and things like that. And again, don't frame this in terms of war games where that's a defined thing. You can keep this more loose. Uh, if you think about it in terms of an RPG, it's often easier. And that's what this model was made to be about. But I think it applies over to war games as well. I think it applies to games in general. Um, the narrativist wants to see a story. And the beats of what happens need to align with that story, right? There needs to be highs and lows, wins and losses, suffering and victory and all that sort of thing, right? And they want that to all revolve around the theme. If the theme is this sort of dark Cthulhu thing, then the story needs to end badly, right? That's a narrativist, okay? Because that's how Cthulhu stories end. They end badly. 
All right. So that's the three types. Now, in the old world in 8th edition, the thing about it was it very much favored gamists because it was big and it was complex. Very large, complex rule sets favor gamists because they are the ones who are the most willing and able to get into that rule set and find the nuance, the corner cases, the small things to exploit and, and win. Again, this it sounds like I'm being negative to this sort of psychographic profile, and I'm not. That is a very valid creative agenda. So this is not me attacking those people. I have been those people. It's okay. That's what the game supported. To a lesser degree, it simulated or it, it appealed to the simulationist crowd because there was some element of that, and probably least of all, it fit with the narrativist because in the end, it's a dice game and it's fairly random and it's hard to make it tell a specific story. Um, you can, and there are people who do great things with the narrative. Uh, people like Materium do awesome narrative stories, but you know that's they're sort of after narrating or pre narrating. There's no, like, authorial control, right? Which is not, again, a bad thing. It's just the game isn't built to do that, which is probably why a lot of people don't do it. If it was built to do that, you would see a lot of people playing in that way. So, when Age of Sigmar came out, the first thing I noticed was that it was built with a completely different creative agenda in mind. It was built to facilitate the simulationist and the narrativist, the people who wanted to tell a story, right, and who wanted this sort of simple, consistent thing. There was less meat there for the gamers to get at. Now, I personally believe the game is very complex, very complex. Those four pages of rules are highly misleading because the interaction of very simple rules can lead to incredibly complex things. You, as a person, boil down to some pretty simple elements, okay? Uh, there is not a lot of different things in you. Yet, the varied combination of those extremely simple elements have made you a walking, talking, thinking, sentient being. But if I boiled you down, which I wouldn't do, I like you, you're just a bunch of simple molecules or atoms that are, uh, that are really not complex, okay? So... The story there is, a simple base does not a non-complex thing make. That's nonsense, right? We just need to get, that's, if I could abolish one thought from the community, that is it. Uh, and the fact that you have complexity throughout all the War Scrolls and everything else that's out there, there's a huge amount of hidden complexity in this game. But when you look at the game, it appeals more to the simulationist who wants this consistent experience. And moreover, it really appeals to the narrativist. Because this game is primed to run on scenarios. When you open up the Age of Sigmar box set, what you see are six scenarios made to walk you through a story. And the play experience you have at that moment is meant to take you through the evolving story of Sigmar and the forces and opening this gate. The first book that's coming out here in two days, or maybe it's already out when you're watching this, is made to tell this more story, this narrative. And the scenarios that are there fit that. If you look at the end time stuff, what was happening in 8th edition, that was, the, that was what was changing, right? Even before the rules changed to enable this, the books themselves were adapting to be more narrativist focused. Now, I've seen some of the scenarios, and, and what excites me is they, they're not set forces. They have the battle, the sort of scenario thing, and it fits to a particular point in the story, featuring the forces that are whatever there in the story, but they open it up to be played by anyone. So we can use these, which is great to tell our own stories, which is awesome because that's what we want to do. That's what I want to do. So if you're, a, if you're that type of player, this is really well suited to you. So what does that mean? It means that the other types of players, the players with other creative agendas, got a bigger piece of the pie in Age of Sigmar. So if you're somebody who really wants that particular experience, that creative agenda, that gamist step on up thing, right, where you can win by reading more pages and internalizing more rules, which is what the old world allowed, uh, 
then, you know, this probably isn't the game for you. And that's okay because it's a valid play style and there are challenges and nuance to it and important things to unlock and discover. None of that is bad. Okay. It is all perfectly valid. One of the real things I want to take home, I want you to take away from this, is there's not like a, there are very few wrong ways to build a game. Like if you build it so it actually doesn't function, that's bad. But building it with different creative agendas, having simple rules versus complex rules, none of these things are innately better than anything else. They just appeal to different people. So if this doesn't appeal to you, that's all right. That's cool. But I do, I, but I would love it if people would give it a chance. And I think it'd be awesome to see if maybe you could explore a different creative agenda, to try something different and see how you like it. Because I think there is a lot of fun to be had there. And I think it's easy to say, well, this is the way I did it. I don't like to change. This is what I like. I don't like other things. Well, okay. That's fine. You're you're with, you're well within your rights to do that, and that's no problem. But maybe, just maybe, if you try something new, like your mom and probably everybody else in your life and every moral at the end of some high school television show told you, you could have a good time. And maybe you won't. And if you don't, that's okay, too. Um, one of the best parts about this is that we've all got to try it basically for zero dollars, so, which is awesome. Uh, we get to explore and figure out if this maybe if we could have fun, if we could, you know, garner some enjoyment out of a different creative agenda for no investment. So that's cool. So I think that once you understand that the game is pursuing a different creative agenda, that it's speaking to a different mode of play, and you pursue the game in that mode of play, in other words, you don't try to bend the game to your will, but you let yourself play the game the way it was sort of written to be played best, then you open yourself up to having a good time, right? You're enjoying the game in the way it's most able to be done. Now, that's not to say that it couldn't be made more gamist. In fact, this is one of the things I love about it. The simplicity of this game means that it's easy to make it more complex. If we want to write comps and tournament packs and points and whatever else to play this in a hardcore win fashion, we can do it, and it's easy. And how easy is it? I don't know. The box set hasn't been out a week, and I've looked at three different full point systems. I've seen ten different good comp systems, pool choices. Doesn't seem that difficult to me. We're a week into it, if, and uh, all that's out. A simple game can be made complex very easily. A complex game can never be made simple because it is almost impossible to reduce out those elements, okay, without losing something in the game. When it's a big, complex web, when you pull on one string, the whole web comes along, okay? But a simple game is just a foundation. I can build on that all I want and the extra pieces. And we've been empowered as a community to do that. So what I say is, let's embrace a slightly different creative agenda when we're, when we're playing the game, you know, in a friendly fashion. Let's build the stuff we need to when we want to play the sort of game as creative agenda in a tournament setting. And let's have more fun in more ways than we ever did before. And to me, that's the best part about this. I probably said that like three times. There's a lot of best parts about this. That's what I think. That's my little talk for today. I hope you found it interesting. I hope nobody's unconscious yet or asleep. But uh, I want to know what you think. Join in the conversation. Leave your comments below. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Like it if you like it. Always appreciate that. Look, to, look forward to continuing the conversation with you. See you next time.